everyone. I hope everyone is having a great day today. Um, Walter will not be able to join us today, um, but he sends his wishes and I hope we have a great question and answer period to follow. Um, today we'll be hearing from Ainsley Smith. Ainsley is currently a biomedical engineering master's student with Dr. Sarah Mansky here at the University of Calgary. And she plans to transfer to the PhD program this coming January. Prior to her master's, Ainsley completed her bachelor's in life sciences at McMaster University. During her bachelor's, she worked on designing physiotherapy exercise technology to help older adults improve mobility. Ainsley also completed a summer research project in epidemiology at Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. Her current research interests include ICU acquired weakness, muscle composition, risk factors, and mechanisms of muscle weakness. During her PhD, she plans to further explore applications for CT calibration. As a fun fact, Ainsley is passionate about mental health and is the chair of the Graduate Student Association's Mental Health and Wellness Committee. She is also the VP Academic for the Biomedical Engineering Graduate Student Association. In her free time, she loves to hike and spend time with friends. As a reminder, I will first turn it over to Ainsley for her presentation, and then we will have a question and answer period to follow. And at that time, I'll remind everyone how to submit a question. So with that, Ainsley, you're welcome to start sharing your screen and begin your presentation. Okay. Uh, there we go. Hopefully everyone can see my screen. Uh, thank you, Emily, for a very wonderful introduction. And yeah, I'll just jump right into things. So intensive care unit acquired weakness or ICU acquired weakness is a debilitating condition associated with critical illness that can lead to long-term weakness, uh, prolonged bed rest, and an extended hospital stay. ICU-acquired weakness is different from severe disuse atrophy, and it's characterized by a preferential loss of myosin, leading to generalized and symmetrical loss of muscle function in both the limbs and the respiratory muscles. This acquired weakness cannot be explained by anything besides critical illness and the treatments of critical, critical illness. ICU-acquired weakness is also quite common, affecting 43% of patients on mechanical ventilation in the ICU. There are several known risk factors that may increase a patient's odds of developing ICU-acquired weakness during their ICU stay. Observational studies indicate that mechanical ventilation, severity of illness, systemic inflammation, and sepsis increase a patient's likelihood of, of developing ICU-acquired weakness. To support this, medical imaging data has also demonstrated that sepsis patients experience a greater decline in muscle volume than age, BMI, and sex matched trauma patients. The pathophysiology behind these risk factors are unknown, but it's likely that inflammation and immobility play key roles in the development of ICU-acquired weakness in patients with these risk factors. ICU-acquired weakness is also associated with other risk factors, notably metabolic factors. Studies indicate that metabolic factors such as corticosteroid use, macronutrient deficiencies, hyperglycemia, electrolyte disorders, and more increase risk for ICU muscle loss. Although the mechanistic details remain unknown, this relationship is unsurprising considering that muscle tissue plays an important role in metabolism. Specifically, there exists a complex relationship between glucose homeostasis and the structural composition of muscle which may have a higher fat concentration in patients who are critically ill. However, certain metabolic conditions, for example, obesity, may affect muscle differently in those who are critically ill compared to other populations. Several studies have identified that obesity is correlated with hyperglycemia and increased fat content within muscular structures, leading to muscle weakness. But critical care studies indicate that obesity may actually be a protective factor for ICU-acquired weakness. Clearly, the relationship between metabolic function and ICU-acquired weakness is both complex and multifactorial. Risk factors associated with ICU-acquired weakness can provide clues about potential cellular mechanisms. 
Muscle biopsies, while invasive, can help us understand what's occurring at the cellular level when an ICU patient is experiencing weakness. These biopsies show a decrease in myosin to actin ratio, inflammation, necrosis, and also adipose infiltration. This indicates that the disease process includes both muscle atrophy and structural alterations, which leads to both muscle shrinking and muscle damage. But research has yet to link these two pathways with the associated risk factors. It's unclear what triggers these specific mechanisms and how exactly these mechanisms contribute to weakness over the course of critical illness. By linking ICU-acquired weakness risk factors with cellular mechanisms, we can start to understand the complexities of the disease process and potential strategies for prevention and treatment. But a major challenge with, with ICU-acquired weakness clinical care and research is the absence of feasible and non-invasive diagnostic techniques. Although muscle biopsies provide valuable information about tissue health, this method is invasive and too expensive for large-scale use. Since biopsies are so invasive, they're usually only taking one, taken once, making the results limited by a lack of temporal relationship to the disease course. In other words, it's unclear how changes in muscle progress over time in the ICU and how that progression relates to mechanisms and risk factors. Current clinical diagnostic methods include voluntary assessment of muscle weakness, dynamometry, and electrophysiological assessments. But these methods are limited by their dependency on patient consciousness and cooperation, often excluding those with more severe illness. Further, they provide little information on the mechanisms responsible for the acquired muscle weakness. Medical imaging is a potential technique to feasibly assess muscle cross-sectional area and fat infiltration that's both non-invasive and does not require voluntary movement. Ultrasonography can be conveniently used at the bedside, but tends to underestimate muscle loss. And magnetic resonance imaging, or MRI, provides excellent soft tissue contrast, but is relatively expensive and not routinely done in the ICU. However, CT imaging overcomes these limitations. A large proportion of critical care patients undergo several CT images throughout their stay in the ICU. So these scans can potentially be repurposed for accurate muscle health assessment throughout the disease course without necessitating large costs. CT imaging can also provide information about both muscle atrophy and muscle structural alterations so that both risk factors are sorry so that risk factors and mechanisms mechanisms can be linked. CT scans provide information about muscle health through quantitative measures of muscle cross-sectional area and also muscle density. Muscle cross-sectional area measures can provide information on muscle atrophy, whereas density measures can provide information about muscle structural alterations and also fat infiltration. This distinction can help unveil potential mechanisms associated with the acquired weakness. CT images provide information about muscle density with Hounsfield units, and these Hounsfield units represent the average mass attenuation coefficient of each voxel in a CT image, which is in part dependent on the density of the materials in that voxel. But measured Hounsfield units can be altered by X-ray energy flux, object position within the scanner bore, spatial resolution, beam hardening, and more. This makes it challenging to reliably compare Hounsfield units as a proxy for muscle density between different scanners and scan protocols. A standard solution in the research setting is to calibrate Hounsfield units to material density values using a phantom made of materials of known densities, such as this one shown in the image here. But phantoms are not used for clinical diagnoses and are not included in clinical scans. There's also poor availability of muscle density phantoms. Because of this, muscle research studies tend to report muscle density in Hounsfield units, despite a lack of reliability. On the other hand, for bone density analyses, phantomless or internal calibration techniques have been developed to su successfully mitigate this problem. Several internal calibration methods have been developed to convert Hounsfield units into bone mineral density values. In all methods, regions of interest, or ROIs, of several materials, uh, for example, air, muscle, adipose, bone, and blood, are selected rather than an external phantom. Some methods calibrate Hounsfield units of these regions of interest to previously determine tissue equivalent reference values, 
However, a potentially more robust method involves instead estimating the effective scan energy using mass attenuation values of materials within the scan and then deriving the relationship between Hounds field units and material density. Although internal density calibration has been successfully employed for bone mineral density analysis, none of these methods have been tested for density analysis of muscle, which attenuates x-rays differently than bone. So the purpose of my project is to examine the interaction between muscle, critical illness, and the associated risk factors to better understand ICU-acquired disease mechanisms. We will use clinically acquired CT scans and an internal calibration technique for muscle density analysis. This work will help improve our understanding of the complexities of care and specific challenges that individuals with ICU acquired weakness experience. It will also indicate risk factors for muscle atrophy and structural muscle alterations, as well as inform prevention and treatment options for ICU acquired weakness. So the overall objective is to use opportunistic CD image analysis and electronic medical record data to understand the mechanisms and time course of ICU acquired weakness, as well as the effects of age, baseline health status, metabolic disorders, and treatment methods on ICU acquired weakness. I have three aims. The first is to validate an internal calibration method for CT muscle density analysis. The second is to evaluate muscle atrophy and structural alterations in patients who are critically ill with opportunistic CT imaging. And then finally, I aim to assess metabolic risk factors for muscle area and density loss among patients who are critically ill. For this presentation, I'll focus on aim one. For this aim, we hypothesize that our internal calibration method will be comparable to the traditional phantom calibration method and will be a more robust measure of muscle density than no calibration method, as reported in Hounsfield units and as currently used in muscle density research. So to validate an internal calibration method for CT muscle density analysis, we started by scanning 10 bovine muscle samples with varying degrees of fat infiltration. Bovine bone, bovine adipose, and swine blood were also included in these scans and used for the internal calibration method. We also included a custom sucrose phantom that was developed using five vials of different sucrose water concentrations with densities ranging from one gram per milliliter to 1.11 grams per milliliter. We scanned the muscle samples, internal calibration tissue samples, and the phantom all together using a clinical CT scanner. We used two different scan protocols and five different object positions within the scanner bore. And this was done to test the reliability of the internal calibration method. For the protocols, we used the standard clinical chest and standard clinical abdominal protocols, which differ in slice thickness, x-ray tube current, and some other parameters as well. And this was done uh, to mimic what we would see in a clinical setting. Patients may be positioned differently and different protocols may be used, which will affect the Hounsfield unit values. After the scanning, I applied the two calibration methods. We adapted the internal calibration approach described by Mahalski Al for muscle density analysis. This approach estimates the effective scan energy by relating the mass attenuation coefficients and the measured Hounsfield units of internal regions of interest, such as air, muscle, adipose, bone, and blood. The relationship between Hounsfield units and material density is then derived mathematically. I optimize the internal calibration method for muscle density analysis by determining the effects of region of interest selection on the output muscle density values compared to those derived from the traditional phantom calibration method. We selected regions of interest in the air, blood, muscle, adipose, and cortical bone regions approximately every 10 slices in the axial plane. Then the 10 scans with the two protocols and the five positions were individually calibrated using both the internal calibration method based on the material ROIs or regions of interest identified in the previous step and the traditional phantom calibration method. For the traditional phantom calibration method, we correlated the known density of each vial of sucrose water calculated based on the concentration of sucrose with the corresponding observed Townsfield unit values in a linear equation. So now I'll go into the results. So I first tested the inclusion of different regions of interest to optimize the internal calibration method for muscle density analysis. The error is here on the y-axis and the mean is on the x-axis 
And I found that when bone is included as a region of interest, as shown here in green, there's a lot of error compared to the phantom method. However, when bone is removed, that error is reduced. I also tried removing muscle and blood as regions of interest. I removed muscle to avoid any bias in the calibrated density results, since muscle is a tissue of interest. And I tried removing blood as a region of interest to simplify the method because um, bone, or sorry, blood can be difficult to identify in a CT scan. And I found that removing muscle and blood as regions of interest did not appear to have any notable effect um, on the resulting muscle density values. And so it appears that we can just use air and adipose as regions of interest, and that this is sufficient for the muscle for muscle density analysis. So based on these results, the internal calibration method specifically refined for muscle density analysis will only include air and adipose as regions of interest. And for the rest of the results, when I talk about the internal calibration method, this is what I'll be referring to. So I then compared the refined internal calibration method with the phantom calibration method using linear regression. And I found an R squared value of greater than 0.99, indicating that the two methods are highly correlated. This figure here shows internal derived muscle density on the y-axis and phantom derived muscle density on the x-axis. And these points here are 10 muscle samples in a single CT scan. Here you can see the performance of the internal calibration method in comparison to the phantom calibration method. So the error is here on the y-axis, again, and the mean is on the x-axis. And these colors all represent the different scans with different positions and protocols. You can see that the internal calibration method does tend to slightly underestimate density in comparison to the phantom method, but the error is quite low at about 0.01 grams per centimeter cubed at most. I also measured the coefficient of variance of the internal calibration and phantom calibration method for muscle samples across different scan protocols and positioning. This graph includes the coefficient of variation values uh, for the 10 scans. Coefficient of variance is here on the y-axis and then the calibration method is on the x-axis. As you can see, the internal calibration method was just as robust as the phantom calibration method. There was no statistical difference between the two. However, no calibration, as reported in Hounsfield units, was much more variable across the different scan conditions. So the significance of this first aim is that it's the first research project uh, that we know of to use CT internal calibration to evaluate muscle density. The internal calibration method was found to be comparable to the phantom calibration method, and this will enable accurate assessment of muscle density in clinically acquired CT scans that do not include an external phantom. This method will also allow clinically acquired CT scans to be repurposed for large multi-site studies to investigate muscle density. And through this type of research, we can um, learn more about the mechanisms associated with IC required weakness to develop our understanding of potential treatment and also prevention strategies. I also wanted to determine a reliable anatomical location to measure muscle cross-sectional area and density. Muscle research often involves looking at the third lumbar vertebra, and it's well accepted that cross-sectional area here is correlated with total muscle volume. Uh, there's also extensive research on the psoas muscle, which is in this bluish color here. And this is because this is a large muscle that's easy to identify and distinguish from others. However, some critical care patients only undergo chest CT scans that do not include the third lumbar vertebra or L3. Um, and so to make our research more broadly applicable, we could focus on analyzing muscle density at the first lumbar vertebra or L1 instead. And to decide on the best location, myself and another rater segmented muscle for 10 CT scans at four anatomical locations. So we looked at total muscle at L3, just the psoas muscle at L3, and then total muscle at L1, and just the psoas muscle at L1. ICC estimates and their 95th percent uh, confidence intervals are shown here in the table. And these were calculated based on absolute agreement and a two-way model. The values for each location are very high, with psoas muscle at L3 having the best agreement. These results do make sense. As I was segmenting the muscles, I noticed that the psoas muscle at L3 is the easiest to distinguish from other tissues and also the fastest to segment. 
There are also other advantages to observing the psoas muscle. Uh, the psoas muscle may undergo more pronounced muscle changes than abdominal muscles in patients with IC required weakness. And this is because the psoas has a higher proportion of type two muscle fibers, which are more likely to be affected by IC required weakness than type one fibers. On the other hand, abdominal muscles, uh, as shown here, have a higher proportion of type one fibers. Uh, the psoas muscle is also composed of parallel muscle fibers, which may mean that measures of cross-sectional area are a better predictor of muscle function. Based on my results and the literature, I decided to focus on the psoas muscle at the third lumbar vertebra for future analyses. And I think my camera may have gone out here. I'm just gonna see. Hopefully that's better. Um, so yeah, moving on to some next steps now. Um, since ICU acquired weakness is characterized by affecting the limbs, it would also be interesting to observe muscle changes at the extremities. Although ICU patients don't typically undergo CT imaging at the limbs, the upper thigh may be within the field of view in some abdominal scans. Imaging studies have reported that CT muscle density and cross-sectional area at the thigh is correlated with physical performance and muscle strength. Likewise, histology studies have indicated that the vastus lateralis is an anatomical location that does undergo myofibril shrinking and fat infiltration in critical care patients. The vastus lateralis is primarily made up of type two fibers like the psoas muscle. So it'd be really interesting to compare and contrast the changes that these muscle groups undergo due to ICU acquired weakness. Since men, many studies investigating mechanisms associated with IC required weakness involve taking muscle biopsies, we're also looking into comparing CT imaging findings with muscle biopsies for the same patients. These biopsies could be feasibly collected from the psoas muscle in ICU patients undergoing surgery for intra-abdominal sepsis. Gastronemius and soleus biopsies are also occasionally done in the ICU. Um, this image here is taken from a study by Derrida et al. in 2012. And it shows some histological abnormalities in the skeletal muscle of critically ill patients. Besides fat infiltration, there are signs of necrosis and inflammation. Um, and by looking at muscle biopsies, we could compare and contrast measures of fat infiltration from CT internal calibration with measures of fat infiltration from histology. This could help both further validate the internal calibration method and also highlight some of its limitations. One potential limitation of the internal calibration method is that the resulting muscle density values may differ in CT scans that are contrast enhanced compared to those that are not. The CT image here on the left is a CT angiography of a, critical, of a critically ill patient. Contrast is used in this scan to facilitate the visualization of arteries. You can see here that the aorta appears quite bright compared to other tissues. And then on the right here is a non-enhanced CT scan. This is of a healthy control. And you can see here that the aorta blends in much more with the surrounding tissues. Bone mineral density studies indicate that internal calibration on contrast enhanced scans yields systematically higher bone density values. This challenge can be overcome by applying a correction factor uh, to the artificially high values to convert them into their non-contrast equivalents. It's unknown whether a correction factor would be needed for a muscle density internal calibration method. Um, we aren't using uh, blood as a region of interest, and the method differs from others because it involves estimating the effective scan energy. Um, so the next step is to investigate the internal calibration method for the same tissue samples in a contrast enhanced scan and a non-contrast enhanced scan to determine any biases that may exist, and also to determine the appropriate uh, correction factors if needed. So besides future, future uh, research, testing the internal calibration method, the next step of this project is actually to apply the method. As a reminder, the second aim is to evaluate muscle atrophy and structural alterations in patients who are critically ill with opportunistic CT imaging. This will involve acquiring clinical CT scans of 50 critical care patients and 50 age and sex match controls. With these scans, I will segment the muscle to determine muscle cross-sectional area, and I will apply the internal calibration method to determine muscle density and estimate fat infiltration.
Finally, I'll compare muscle cross-sectional area and fat infiltration between admission and discharge scans, between controls and critical care patients, and then also between trauma and sepsis patients. The third aim is to assess the metabolic risk factors for muscle area and density loss among patients who are critically ill. And the workflow of this aim will look similar to what will be done for AIM-2, except that chart reviews will also be conducted, and this will be to identify patients with metabolic disorders, such as hyperglycemia, obesity, and nutrient deficiencies. CT scans of these ICU patients with metabolic disorders will be compared with CT scans of ICU patients without metabolic disorders uh, to investigate potential differences in muscle cross-sectional area and also fat infiltration between the two groups. Besides ICU-acquired weakness, there are several other applications for internal density calibration. Sarcopenia is age-related progressive and generalized loss of skeletal muscle mass and, mass and strength. It can lead to falls, fractures, and hospitalization. Future research could investigate internal calibration as a method to screen for sarcopenia. Studies have indicated that muscle density might be a better predictor of poor muscle strength than muscle mass or cross-sectional area. For example, one CT study found a statistically significant association between muscle density and strength, but not between muscle area and strength. And this was after adjusting for age, height, and weight. Another potential application for internal density calibration could be to predict health outcomes of surgical patients. A CT imaging study found that patients with lower muscle density that underwent uh, cardiovascular surgery had poor muscle function and a greater risk of mortality. On the other hand, muscle area was not found to be associated with muscle function or mortality. Other studies have reported similar findings that muscle quality can predict surgical patient health outcomes. While these studies observe uh, muscle density in Hounsfield units, greater accuracy and reliability in these results could be achieved through the use of internal calibration. COVID-19 patients are another population that may benefit from internal density calibration. Many patients recovering from COVID-19 experience lingering muscle weakness. A cross-sectional study found that almost 70% of COVID-19 survivors who were on mechanical ventilation experienced limb weakness and 44% of those patients with limb weakness were unable to walk 100 meters 30 days after weaning. It's unclear whether this weakness is the same or different than IC required weakness, and internal density calibration could help uncover mechanisms and changes in muscle composition following illness with COVID-19. Lastly, for inflammatory myopathies such as inclusion body myositis and dermatomyositis, MRI imaging is often used in the diagnostic process to look for fat infiltration. Then afterwards, a muscle biopsy is taken for a con conclusive diagnosis. It is possible that the internal calibration um, of CT imaging could be a cheaper and faster, faster alternative for MRI imaging to screen for inflammatory myopathies. It's important to note that inflammatory myopathies are also characterized by muscle structural alterations due to inflammatory cells and protein deposits. And so it's unclear how these types of infiltration will it affect muscle density similarly or differently than fat infiltration. Uh, but this could be investigated through a comparison of CT findings and histology findings. So just to conclude, a CT uh, internal calibration is comparable to the traditional phantom calibration method at measuring muscle density. Accurate assessment of muscle density with internal calibration can be broadly applied to help diagnose, treat, and understand mechanisms of muscle weakness. Further research is required to understand the limitations of internal calibration and assess its usefulness in clinical and research settings. And then finally, I'll finish off by saying that my future work will focus on validating the internal calibration method and specifically applying it to IC required weakness. I want to thank everyone for listening um, and also thank my lab team, uh, the Mansky Lab, and especially Dr. Sarah Mansky for all her guidance and support throughout this project. Great, Ainsley. Thank you so much for that presentation. Um, everyone in the audience, I would kindly ask you at this time to turn on your camera if you're comfortable to allow for a better discussion. Um, the floor will now be open for the question and answer period. 
To ask a question, you can use the raise hand function in Zoom by clicking on um, reactions on the lower part of your screen. I will then call on individuals from there. Alternatively, if you are unable to use the raise hand function, you may type your question in the chat box and I will ask your question aloud. And I, I think we have plenty of time today, but just as a reminder, I'm gonna make sure that we wrap up the discussion by 4.15. Maybe while we wait for people to get their questions ready, Ainsley, I'll start off with a question. Um, could you talk again why muscle density would be more correlated to muscle strength than cross-sectional area? Yeah, I'm not sure the exact answer to that question, um, but I think as, as fat infiltrates into muscle, it's possible that the cross-sectional area is preserved. Um, because instead of just losing muscle, that's replaced by fat. Um, and so um, I would assume that the reason why that's correlated with muscle strength is because um, you have less muscle fibers working, um, even with the same cross-sectional area. And so it's a reduction in muscle quality. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Gable, please ask your question. Hi, Ainsley. Thank you for uh, your talk. Sorry, my video is off because my internet's a bit unstable at the moment. Um, I had um, a big picture question about ICU acquired muscle weakness and then sort of a follow up. And I guess I don't know the literature well, but what is the implication for ICU acquired muscle weakness in the long term? How does it contribute to long term morbidity and mortality? Or do we know if it tends to recover? So I guess I'm coming from the bed rest and space flight study fields. And we know that, you know, within about six weeks or eight weeks after return from space, muscle performance tends to return to baseline. So is this a really huge problem long term? And then if it is, can you capture recovery CT scans? Like, will you be able to follow up some of these patients and look at not only muscle loss, but then muscle recovery? Yeah, thank you very much for those questions. Um, from what I read in the literature, it is uh, my understanding that this is something that persists long term. So it's not something that as soon as you're discharged from the ICU, you bounce back really quickly, something that can lead to long term weakness, reduced quality of life and disability. Um, and in terms of looking at CT, follow up CTs, um, I, I love that idea, and that's something that Sarah and I have talked about, um, you know, looking to see how, how these people are functioning six months or even a year after they've been discharged from the ICU, I think would be really interesting. Um, and it would also be interesting to look at the differences between patients who may have more of an ICU-acquired weakness, maybe that's more sepsis patients, versus a trauma patient who may be experiencing muscle weakness more because of disuse rather than um, the mechanisms that we think to be associated with ICU-acquired weakness. Hopefully that answers your question. But yeah, I think that, I think it would be really interesting to look at follow-up scans. Yeah, thanks Ainsley. And I think it'll be really interesting. Obviously it's gonna differ based on the reason they're in the ICU and probably huge difference between those trauma patients uh, versus uh, other sort of critical care illnesses. Thank you. Would anybody in the, the seminar room who has a question, please go ahead. Hi Ainsley, nice presentation. I had a similar question as Lee about the, whether it's the ICU stay itself or the recovery that's causing the loss. But then, so that was kind of answered. The second one was if this was more of a problem in elderly people versus uh, younger individuals. So like elderly people presumably have worse long-term health outcomes due to ICU weakness than, than a younger person might, but I don't know if that's actually true or not. Yeah, I think that's a really good question. And that's something that we're wondering as well. Um, I don't know the answer to that question. I don't know whether age um, and or you know, maybe pre-existing um, sarcopenia or muscle weakness may impact how someone um, experiences muscle loss in the ICU and also during their recovery. But that is something that we're looking into with our with our second aim. Uh, we want to look at age and sex um, match critical care patients and controls to really get an understanding of who's at a greater risk of of ICU acquired weakness. And my hypothesis would be that 
those who are older or who maybe come into the ICU already experiencing muscle weakness uh, may be more likely to develop muscle weakness during their ICU stay and also have a longer recovery. Um, so I think that that probably is an important piece to the puzzle um, that we're really interested in looking at as well. Siska, please go ahead. Hey, thanks. Thanks for your talk. I was wondering if you can just uh, talk a bit more about what your expectations are um, in terms of if you're comparing muscle density of different uh, po uh, patient populations and then how you would um, adjust the, because you were saying that based on those findings, you can change uh, potentially uh, rehabilitation protocols or how you would account for those differences or what you would different, like how you would defer your rehabilitation programs based on the results? Yeah, so for the first part of that question, looking at different populations, um, besides looking at age and sex, we're also really interested in looking at uh, patients with different metabolic disorders. For example, patients who are obese or patients who um, are being fed different ways in the ICU. So I, I think that that could impact how patients experience muscle loss in the ICU. Um, I'm not exa exactly sure how it would differ. And then for, um, for rehabilitation, to be honest, I haven't thought too much about how we could um, change rehabilitation based on what we know in the ICU, but something that I think would be really valuable is to know who is at risk of having a longer road to recovery um, so that those people can be connected with the right services to ensure that they can have a smoother transition. Hopefully that someone answers your question. Okay, thank you. Tim, please go ahead. Thank you, Ainsley. That was really a really interesting uh, talk and, and I think it's gonna be fabulous when all the results come out. But, and I apologize if you mentioned this, you know, if I, if I wasn't paying enough attention, but, but you know, muscle loss in the ICU, particularly with ventilated patients, you know, the most destructive or the most distressing loss, of course, is in the breathing muscles. And you're sort of looking at postural muscles. Have you thought about trying to capture the information about quality deterioration and atrophy in, say, the diaphragm in these patients that are, you know, mechanically ventilated? Yeah, we have thought about that for sure. Um, the thing that was kind of holding us back is since the diaphragm is such a weird shape, um, we weren't sure how we could reliably um, measure cross-sectional area or density, um, you know, getting a, the same anatomical area in each patient. But I do think that that, is, that should definitely be a next step to look at the diaphragm because I've read the same thing that um, many, I, I've read that um, people do tend to experience even um, poor muscle quality and more muscle loss in the diaphragm compared to the psoas muscle and other um, other muscle structures. So that's definitely something we've been thinking about, but just aren't quite sure how to tackle that yet. Oh, okay, thank you. Thanks for your question. Benno, please go ahead. A very simple question for you. What is opportunistic CT imaging and where does the name come from? So opportunistic CT imaging is taking CT scans that were acquired for clinical purposes um, and then using them for research. So what we're planning on doing is using clinically acquired CT scans that are taken in the ICU. Um, and, and many patients, almost all patients in the ICU do have um, many CT scans taken throughout their stay. And so we wanna repurpose those for research purposes rather than getting people to come into the lab and doing imaging um, at, at the lab. And so, yeah, that, that's our plan. And we're thinking that this will allow us to get more data. But I mean, your study doesn't depend on that. You could so, do, you could do they have, have data from anywhere. Yeah, we could, we could definitely have uh, people come into the lab alternatively. And we might um, do that for maybe follow, if we look at follow-up. Um, but for the majority of the study and for uh, my aims, at least, we'll be looking at um, CT scans that were taken in the ICU. Okay, 
Thank you. Thank you. Brent, please go ahead. Hi, Ainsley. Um, uh, I have a question about why bone does so poorly. Uh, what do you think is going on there? Um, as a region of interest? Yeah, why does it introduce this source of error when you compare it to the phantom? I think that the primary reason is probably because it's just so much more dense than muscle. And so I think by looking at um, fat, um, and, well, I guess air is, is much less dense. So, um, but yeah, I think that that's one thing, it's much more dense. And so even a small variation in cortical bone density could really throw off um, the calibration. And then I think another reason um, is that cortical bone isn't perfectly homogeneous. And that's also the case for other regions of interest. Um, but I think that that may be having an effect on the calibration curve as well. But I don't have a, I don't have like a definite answer. Those are my, that's what I'm thinking though. Those are the two assumptions. Yeah, no, I mean, I, that's what I thought. I thought it was because it's so far high in the Hounsfield unit scale that it really was going to manipulate the regression equation when you fit uh, the curve. But then I also noticed that, were you using that mind waves phantom for the um, internal? Yeah, so we had those in the scan, but we didn't actually use them for any of these analyses. We used a sucrose phantom instead. Oh, okay, all right. So it had nothing to do with the fact that the mind waves has low densities. Um, so what about the sucrose phantoms? Uh, you made those yourselves? Did you, and it was just what? Sugar suspended in water? Yeah, so yeah, we made, that was custom made. Um, and the reason for that is Wait. because, sorry? What does that mean, custom made? Like, like you made it yourself? Made or you... it, yeah, homemade in the lab. Um, okay, yeah. And basically, yeah, that's exactly what we did. We just mixed um, uh, measurements of sugar with water. And then we made sure that we shook it pretty well before we put it in the CT scanner. So the assumption is that it's, the sugar is hopefully relatively evenly distributed throughout um, the fluid. Um, and it was low enough concentrations that we think it was, it, it should be, it should have been fully dissolved. You could verify that too though, right? By looking at the variation in the Hounsfield units for the, for the solution that you segment out, just to make sure that it's nicely suspended in the water. Yeah, absolutely. Um, from, from the phantom values that I've looked at, it seems to be pretty much what we were expecting, but I agree that it might be a better, a good idea for me to go back and look at, um, maybe take a volume because I only took area, um, but take a larger volume so I could see what the standard deviation is and how much it really varies throughout the fluid. Um, the other thing that I always thought, and so you got to correct me, um, I always thought that a Hounsfield unit of error, regardless of the CT, um, settings was always negative 1000. Um, am I wrong? Is that just a rule of thumb? It's negative 1000? Um, or, or is it always negative 1000 for error? Yeah, in a properly calibrated CT scan, it should always be negative 1000. Um, we found that in, in the CT scan images that we have, it's 99.99 usually. There's a very low standard deviation um, for, for the air regions of interest. And now that you mentioned that, that may be the reason why, even though that's way less than dense, that way less dense than muscle, we can get away with using it as a region of interest um, because it's not as variable as bone, even though they are both nowhere near muscle in terms of density. Yeah, I just wonder if all you need to do is segment out a piece of fat and just assume negative 1,000 for an error every time. But um, may, maybe there is a, a little bit of variation in that that you're accounting for. Um, the other thing I noticed, uh, back to the bone thing, was that it's a real, real small piece of bone that you segmented out, right? Uh, unless I was wrong. Uh, and so I just wonder if there you know, maybe you didn't get a great representation of the bone density from that segmentation. Yeah, that's entirely possible. Um, so I did take 
uh, regions of interest to the bone about every 10 slices. So I did take it throughout the image, um, but we did have, a, we used a T-bone steak and it's a small bone. We're only grabbing cortical bone as well. So there's not a lot of surface area there. Um, but yeah, I think that that's definitely, that definitely could contribute to one of the reasons why bone kind of threw things off. And um, maybe maybe there would be better luck if we were looking at the femur, for example, in a human scan, and we could have access to a lot more cortical bone. Yeah, the, the only last question I had on that same issue was, do you remember what Andy found? Like, when, when he was doing his internal calibration, did he end up getting better results with bone or, or worse results? He got better. Well, I, I talked to Chantelle about this, and she said that when she tried to take out bone as an ROI, it didn't work very well. So it seems like if um, if you're looking at bone density analysis, having bone cortical bone as a region of interest um, is important, according according to what she told me. Okay, that makes sense then. Uh, okay, I was going to ask one more question. Uh, Maybe I'll just quickly ask it before Sarah asks the question. Uh, how many muscle biopsies can you get, do you think, from the surgery? Uh, because I suspect, you know, you get a small little piece of muscle and then you go, you know, you go a centimeter next door and you get a piece of muscle and the, the density of the biopsy is completely different. And so, um, and of course, when you compare it to your CT, which would probably even be a more accurate measurement of density, you are going to end up, you know, there's going to be error associated with that. So do you have a sense of how many muscle biopsies you're going to be able to get to try to get a good representation of the true muscle density? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, something I've been thinking about as well. I think, and Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I was under the assumption um, in talking to um, Chip Doy, who's ICU physician that's helping advise me um, on this project, that it would just be, you'd just be taking one biopsy per person. Um, and I think that the most important thing that we can do to make sure that that is um, an accurate representation of um, all of the, that muscle is making sure we take it from the thickest area of the muscle so, and, and also the area that we're looking at in the CT scan. So maybe hopefully getting a biopsy that's in a similar area to what we're looking at with our CT images. Um, but yeah, I hadn't thought of getting multiple biopsies from the same patient, but that might be something that we could do if we're, if we're looking at um, getting biopsies from surgical patients. I'm not sure, but that's an interesting thought. Well, I don't know anything about muscle density or biopsies in general, but I know that the people that do this kind of work in skeletal muscle to look at protein expression and stuff like that in, in muscle biopsies will, you know, they need to get at least eight biopsies mm -hmm. to have a good representation of that kind of thing. So I don't know how much density varies by, I don't know how small the, the biopsy is, but you can imagine if you biopsy into a, if it's really small and you get a bunch of fat, then it's going to be different than if you get a nice, you know, some real skeletal muscle. So you might want to try to convince that surgeon to get more than one if you can. Yeah, that's a really good idea because, yeah, you're right that if we, if we like hit a clump of fat, we could think that it's super fatty, but it just might be one area. So yeah, that's a really good idea. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, Ainsley. Sarah, go ahead. Yeah, I just, Brent, I wanted to follow up on the question about the bone and the ROI for calibration, because I think it's an important one. Um, and Ainsley hasn't been focused on the bone density analysis at all, but I think sometimes the findings will apply. Um, I guess one of my fundamental issues when Andy included bone, and you could disagree with me, but if you're calibrating an image using the tissue that you want to measure, you're automatically going to change the results. And so out of principle, I think that if you're gonna calibrate for bone density, you shouldn't be using the bone in the same image. Um, and I think that's probably why when Chantal de Baker went back and checked it, that that improved her results. Um, and that's one of the reasons we had Ainsley take the muscle ROI out of her analysis. So I don't know, I'd be curious your opinion on that, but 
but that's my major concern. Um, the other point too, is if we're looking in the, in the abdominal region around the lumbar spine, like to get a really good ROI in the bo cortical bone is really challenging. It's different than Andy was taking an ROI in the femur. He said you could do it in the vertebral bone, but I don't think he ever actually tested it. Um, yeah. So I, anyways, you were on his committee, so you might know more than me. I don't recall, but uh, I, I like the rationale of not including the tissue of interest in the calibration. That makes sense to me. And then to me, it makes sense that the bone density is so far away from the density that you're interested in that it could really have a large impact on the calibration. So, and then, I don't know, you've already shown how good you can do with just air and fat. So you might, might as well just stick with that. Are there other questions from the audience? Tim, please go ahead. So, so Ainsley, um, I know you 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 talked about using pieces of beef for your for your uh, for, for the work with the marbling and stuff like that. In in human muscle, I suppose maybe some of us have more marbling than others, but. What's what's kind of a little lower threshold where you where you sort of can't de discriminate micro globules of, of fat scattered through the muscle? There must be some voxel size where where you really can't resolve dispersion of these materials. I mean, you can obviously follow a big a big uh, thread, a rope of fat through the muscle or whatever if you're trying to quantify you know the quality. But where do, where does it sort of bottom out? Um, and I just wondered if you if you've got sort of a calibration of finely dispersed versus you know, uh, more coarsely dispersed fat through muscle. Yeah, so um, Sarah, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the clinical CT scanner is um, 0.23 millimeter resolution. Um, I except in the in the Z um, axis, which I think it's greater than that. Um, so that would be the smallest that we could observe. Um, however, from looking at the scans, I've noticed that most of the, most of the time um, we get a partial volume effect where there's a little bit of muscle and a little bit of bone in the same voxel. And so what I'm thinking is it's probably best for when I'm segmenting the muscle to include anything that I think is muscle and maybe even a, a little bit of the fat and then using the density to tell us about fat infiltration because like you said it's really hard to segment out those um the fat um but yeah that's that's kind of i think that's part of the reason why looking at muscle density works well because you can make assumptions about fat infiltration um even when the fat is so small that you can't visually see it in the ct scan and, and, and sort of to follow that up, does, does that go for the blood as well, for the blood in the blood vessels and the capillaries? Can you sort of extract that and sort of put that aside? Because that's going to be there no matter what, unless muscle is more or less perfused. But, but can you sort of take the, the whatever contribution that the blood would make and sort of remove it from the sample? Um, not from what I've seen, and maybe that's just, um, maybe that's something that will come with practice, but I haven't been able to distinguish any of the vessels. It might be different looking at contrast enhanced CT scans. Maybe that would make it easier to avoid uh, those vessels, but um, not an uncontrast enhanced from my experience, at least. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I think we're going to have to make the assumption that the perfusion is the same because we don't have the ability to segment that, but um, I don't know. It'll be interesting to see if there is data from biopsies to suggest that there is a difference in perfusion, for example, with people with ICU acquired weakness and not. And um, the other advantage I think is that blood is relatively close to muscle in, in density compared to fat, I believe. So the effect that it has on the density analysis should probably not be too big. Any other questions from the audience? 
All right, if there are no other questions, please join me in again, thanking Ainsley for her presentation today. Um, next week, we'll be hearing from Arash and his talk title is Effects of Prolonged Downhill Running on Tibial Strains, a Finite Element Analysis. Um, so thank you again, Ainsley, and I hope to see everyone again next week. Thanks everyone.